Hi, this is Nick Manella from the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, and you are listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise, and jam? You are in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical U, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today we have the first of our interview series for Improv Month here at Musical U. To celebrate the launch of our new improv roadmap that helps you learn to improvise from scratch, we've put together a month packed full of material all about improv. In our first episode for Improv Month, I talked about how to approach learning to improvise and how it's something core and fundamental to any musician and how it can take on many forms across many genres. At the same time, improvisation is something that is most commonly associated with jazz music in particular. And so I was keen to kick off Improv Month talking to someone who is expert in how you learn to improvise jazz. Nick Manella is the host of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast which really lives up to its name. As a jazz fan, but not a jazz musician myself, I've really been enjoying listening to his show, and I would highly recommend it for anyone interested in learning to play jazz. The way Nick discusses improv on his show was so well aligned with the way we teach it at Musical U. I knew we had to have him on the show, and I wanted to start Improv Month with this interview, because as you'll hear, so much of learning jazz improvisation is in fact applicable to any genre or style of improvising. In this conversation, we talk about Nick's own upbringing and what he did to compensate for not having a natural ear for music, the specific exercises he finds most useful for learning to improvise, one powerful memory he has that helped set his mindset right for improvisation for years to come, and which he passes on to his students if they're at all shy or nervous about improvising. And we talk about why someone who wants to play jazz might actually be best served by first studying the blues. It was so much fun to talk to Nick about jazz and improv, and he dropped several really valuable nuggets of wisdom in this conversation. Simple things that you can go away and apply yourself and really benefit from. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'd love to start at the beginning. And we know about your fantastic projects these days with the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast and the courses you've been developing. But where did it start for you as a musician? What were those early years like? Yeah, I guess it's pretty uh, a pretty standard story, or at least for people in the in the U.S. Um, I actually grew up. My father is a great saxophone player. Um, had been a music educator. Let's see, he's been teaching music in public schools for about forty years now. So he was a huge inspiration. Uh, played with bands all over the area. Went to Berkeley in Boston in the nineteen seventies. Um, always had an amazing record collection around the house. Uh, and just kind of grew up listening to him play music and and kind of absorbing that culture. Uh, so when it came time to choose an instrument, of course, everybody kind of wants to be like their parents. So I chose the saxophone uh, because that was the instrument that I had kind of been hearing. So that was about, you know, fourth grade. And then uh, I had the distinct opportunity of growing up with one of the best uh, music programs in the area, probably the best music program in the area. Um, so I knew from a young age that I was diving into, first of all, kind of a very serious program that had expectations from their students and just had a general culture of, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it to the maximum. Um, so it took to the saxophone almost immediately. I think that was probably had a lot to do with just listening to so much great music and having the sound in my ears growing up. Um, I don't think it was necessarily natural ability, but an intense desire to do it well, uh, almost right from the very beginning. And also, you know, there were so many great musicians around me and, uh, growing up with my father teaching in the same school system as I was going to, I got to hear all the high school musicians, um, and be sort of around the best of the best in my area. Um, 
so basically just took it from there. And, and as I went through middle school and then high school, started getting more and more serious about it and uh, studying privately. That was a huge thing um, that my father had me do very early because he understood the the value that comes along with having that one on one time with a great teacher. Um, so I think, you know, right in sixth grade, probably I started studying privately with somebody. And that was huge for me because I think you start to realize how deep music is when you get that one on one time with a fantastic musician. Um, and then, you know, when I got to high school, it was just kind of the same, but a little bit more full throttle, a lot more musical opportunities, chances to perform different ensembles. Um, doing things like the the all state festivals and the honors bands and stuff like that, it just kind of got me more and more excited about it as I got older and older and more experienced. Um, ended up deciding to go to school for music, so I went to my undergrad at the University of New Hampshire here in the United States um, and majored in performance. And then ended up taking a year off after that to do some gigging and teaching and just generally live the life of a musician, which was really eye opening for me. And I'm actually very, very glad that I did that, took that year in between uh, undergrad and graduate school. And then I headed out to the Midwest uh, to go to Western Michigan University to do my graduate work. Um, and that really, I think, was a turning point for me. Um, being a graduate student allows you a lot of time that I think undergraduate work doesn't to just concentrate on your instrument. Um, when, when I'm an undergrad, you know, you've got all these classes, you're running around, you're taking all your general education requirements. It's, it's generally just a crazy time of life. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the instrument and music takes a back seat to just kind of being crazy, like I said, kind of running around trying to take care of all this extraneous stuff. Um, so when I got to graduate school, I really felt like, OK, I've got, you know, four to five hours of uninterrupted time. Uh, and the time that is interrupted is to actually go and take classes that are very, very much related to your career after you get out of school. Um, so I truly believe that those two years that I spent in Michigan uh, were some of the best of my life just in terms of really, really getting into what I was going to be doing after school. Um, so that's kind of it. And since I've gotten out of, you know, that was about eight, nine years ago that I graduated uh, from Western Michigan and basically just been doing kind of the approach that I think most musicians have to do these days, a mix of teaching, performing, um, you know, very recently having gotten into the kind of entrepreneurship uh, route. Although I do think that all musicians are naturally entrepreneurs. You won't, you won't last very long uh, if you don't have that entrepreneurial spirit to kind of make things happen for yourself. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. Play with a bunch of bands here around the Boston area. Um, do a, a lot of teaching, both online and in person. Um, and doing these podcasts and doing this kind of uh, online education thing, which I think is going to open up a, do a lot of doors for musicians of the future, uh, this connectedness that we have um, that that wasn't around in the very recent past. You know, we didn't have this. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. That's that's kind of my story. Cool. And you mentioned that jazz was around you almost from the very beginning with your family and your father. Um, was it jazz, jazz, jazz all the way through that journey? It wasn't actually. And I think that's one of the, the best things about it. When I think back on my um, development as a musician, uh, my father was very, very into like a wide breadth of music. Um, he was definitely into jazz, but, you know, bands like Tower Power, um, Chicago. Uh, he was also very, very into like classic rock. Um, and then another thing, I, I came up with a group of musicians uh, that I went through high school with that I still play with to this day a lot. Um, and they opened my eyes to so much different music. Like I'll never forget uh, in, I think it was ninth grade, probably my freshman year, um, somebody, one of my friends handed me a, a Tribe Called Quest CD. And this was like, it blew my mind. You know what I mean? Uh, I wasn't 
on the hip hop radar at all. Didn't think that I would like it. And then I got this record and I, I wore it out. Um, and to this day, like one of the, one of the biggest genres of music that really gets me going is the hip hop side of things. Um, so it really allowed me to, you know, discover a lot about other forms of music and also not be kind of a jazz snob, uh, as, as some people, tend to be they think it's you know the only music that's worth playing worth listening to um and it's i really don't think that's the case you know we had a we had a, a metal band in high school uh so really we had a lot of different stuff going on and i i really credit that to keeping my mind open uh when it comes to playing music mm, and i think you neatly sidestepped a challenge that a lot of musicians have around jazz which is it can seem very intimidating and like an advanced genre you will eventually be able to play. It, it sounds like because you had that taste from the beginning, it was always part of the medley for you. It wasn't that jazz was unreachable that you would eventually get there. Is that right? Exactly. And and the, the thing about jazz is that, I mean, it is intimidating. And that's, I think that's part of the allure, right? Is that this is a type of music that you can go, you can study for your entire life and not get to uh the nexus of of playing jazz there's always something new to learn there's always something that you can improve upon um so yeah that kind of it, it it's a double-sided thing you know where i think part of the reason that people play jazz is because it is intimidating and you can prove something to yourself if you can actually sound really good playing jazz but i do agree with you i think that it is less intimidating to just start um, than a lot of people think it is. Um, you can definitely just go for it um, and come out with a lot of great results without dedicating 12 hours a day to it, you know? So at Musical U, when we cover the topic of improvisation, which is obviously at the heart of jazz, we mm -hmm. come back again and again to your ear and the importance of understanding in your head what's going on in the music, not just intellectually from a theory mm -hmm. perspective, but orally understanding the notes it sounds like you had a i mean the way you describe it it sounds like a very neat straight line trajectory to career success but were there any problems for you along the way did you have a natural ear from day one that let you improvise jazz or how was that journey for you yeah that's a really good question because without a doubt the ear is the the sort of the key to unlocking everything when it comes to music and especially jazz because it's such a it has such an oral tradition to it, you know, real books and and pieces of paper are a fairly new thing uh, in jazz music. You know, if you look back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, there wasn't any of this stuff. You know, you went to the gig and you tried as hard as you could to remember what they were playing, and then you went home and you figured it out, right? Uh, but it definitely wasn't a straight line trajectory to me. Um, in fact, I definitely don't have a natural ear. Um, and that was actually really tough for me when I was coming up because I was actually surrounded by people that had that very natural ability. Um, and at times it was very, very frustrating because I was working so hard to get better at this music. And I was watching some of my peers um, get better a lot faster than I was. And I think it didn't really register with me until I was a little bit older that it was, in fact, my ear that was kind of holding me back. Um, so just like anything else in life, if you're not naturally gifted in a certain skill, I just had to work, work, work on it. Um, and even through my undergraduate work, I was still very, very behind when it came to um, ears. And, and to this day, I still feel very, very behind when it comes to um, oral skills, but it's something that I work on every single day. Um, and it's probably the most important part of my practice routine. In fact, I take care of it. I take care of it at the very, very beginning of my practice every day, because I know that I'm going to be the most on, uh, at the very beginning of my practice routine. My mind is going to be the freshest. So I tend to reserve that for the thing I feel is the most important. Um, and without a doubt for me, that's, that's ears for sure. Um, so it hasn't always been easy. It's still not easy, but, uh, you know, I, I think the difference is today, I realize just how important it is and that I'm trying to get better at it, you know, all the time.
I'm sure that's really reassuring and inspiring for a lot of our listeners to hear that someone mm-hmm. who is as established as a jazz educator as you are didn't find it came naturally from day one and did put in the work and was able to achieve um, what they hoped to in terms of improvisation. Um, take us back, though, to when you were maybe starting to recognize that your ears might be an area for improvement. Mm-hmm. Were there any kind of milestones or light bulb moments or um, concepts that made it easier for you to learn these skills and to develop your ear? Yeah, I think that there was there was definitely one moment I can distinctly remember this where um, whenever I was playing tunes when I was younger, um, the way that I would keep track of where I was in the tune was just simply to like count. So you can see how that could get in the way of fully expressing yourself when you're improvising. If your mind is caught up in don't get lost, don't get lost, don't get lost. I mean, that's a huge hindrance to uh, feeling free when you're improvising. So I can distinctly remember one day being in uh, my jazz combo ensemble in, in college um, and we were playing a tune and all of a sudden I stopped paying attention to the counting and normally this would be the recipe for disaster. I would get totally lost and not be able to recover at all, finish my solo halfway through the form, something like that. Um, but I stopped counting, I let go and all of a sudden I could just hear where the band was. And that was like, you know, the biggest light bulb moment I had gotten to that point was, okay, so a lot of this work that I've been doing, it's paying off. I can actually hear what the chord progression is. And I immediately knew that this was going to be huge for me. You know, it was going to be a thing that um, was going to open a lot of doors for me. Um, so that would be kind of my epiphany moment. And the nice thing about it is, is I found once you can develop that skill and do it one time, you pretty much have that skill from then on, right? Now, it's not like I, I never, ever got lost in a tune ever again in my whole life. I wish it were like that. Um, but it was a moment where I could feel finally confident in my ears and learn to open my playing up a little bit more because because of that confidence and not being tied to, okay, we're in this measure, now we're in this measure, now we're, don't, oh, don't, are, wait, are we in this measure or are we in the, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure almost everybody out there has gone through that feeling of barely hanging on to uh, keeping your place. So just got to keep doing it and eventually it will happen. Uh, I think about playing music as a, as a lifelong series of frustrations followed by epiphanies <laughs> uh, because you work, work, work for months, even years sometimes with no end in sight. And it's easy to get into that mind frame of this is never going to happen for me. This is never going to happen. And then one day, boom, it clicks. And all of a sudden you have that skill for life at that point. Hmm, I think that's a great way to think about it. So at Musical U, one thing we often explain to people is that when it comes to ear training, there are kind of two ways to do it, and one of which we'd call active ear training, where you are doing repetitive exercises, for example, to recognize different types of interval, and you're specifically trying to develop that skill. And the other is what we'd call passive ear training, where you are working in music, you're practicing, you're using your instrument, you might be trying things like playing by ear or improvisation, but you're just kind of allowing your ear to develop passively along the way. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like with that form understanding for you, that was kind of a byproduct of passive ear training. You've been playing and you've been playing these forms and you've been aware of them, but it was a kind of subconscious process that finally unlocked that for you. What's the balance been for you overall in terms of active versus passive? How how have your ears developed over the years? Yeah. I mean, I think the the first thing that comes to mind is that I'm just a huge music fan. So I'm, I'm listening to music all the time. Uh, so that's kind of my passive ear training right there, right? And then uh, going into situations where I'm playing new music by a composer that I've never, ever heard before. Um, and of course, you want your ears to latch on to that first, first and foremost. You're trying to kind of feel out the landscape orally, right? Uh, so that's another form of passive ear training, but you're actively participating in it. Um, And then I think the biggest things in terms of active ear training for me is uh, sight singing. I can't say enough about sight singing. I think that that is 
probably the biggest part of my development in terms of active ear training. Uh, because what you're doing is you're getting your natural instrument, which is your voice, to reproduce a series of intervals or a melody, um, you know, things like learning solfege. And it's it's kind of funny because a lot of jazz musicians will, well, I don't need to know solfege. Um, I don't need to know that stuff. That's for, you know, vocalists or classical musicians or, but it really is something for everybody. You know, if you have that skill down, you can make sense of so much of the music you're playing if you can sing it first, right? Um, and solfege is a great way to go about that. So sight singing, um, things like there's a very, very famous teacher uh, who passed away a couple of years ago in the Boston area named Charlie Bonacus. And since I grew up in the Boston area, a lot of my teachers had studied with him. Um, and he had this great, great ear training system where he would play a little, you know, one, four, one, five, one progression and then play a note and you would have to identify that note. And the beauty of the system was, first of all, you're hearing the note against tonality. So you're hearing it against a uh, cadence that you just heard. So you're learning to relate that note to, uh, like I said, a tonality. But the beauty of this ear training system was that after you get really good at identifying one note, then you move on to two notes, then you move on to three notes, and so on and so forth, until there was a couple of teachers that I had that you could play 11 notes, and they could actually tell you what note you weren't playing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a pretty amazing level of uh, oral comprehension. Um, so that was a big thing that I did. Um, and then just things like, you know, having a friend play chords, identifying them, uh, playing a root and singing up a chord. Uh, so a lot of it was very active for me just because I knew that I had a natural deficit when it came to ear training. Um, but of course, the passive ear training is still happening every day just simply by listening to recordings and maybe singing along with them or um, listening to a recording so much that you know every single note in that recording. Uh, that's a definitely a huge part of it. Um, so I would say it was pretty balanced for me in terms of active and passive. The, the passive being the really fun part and the active being the part that was a lot of hard work. Very cool. So what I love about that answer, and I think the reason I've enjoyed listening to your podcast, the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast so much, is that you, I think, are coming from a similar perspective to us on this topic. You know, you didn't just give the stereotypical jazz educator's response of to train your ears, just transcribe and repeat the vocab of the artists you admire. Clearly to you, it's important to really understand and pick apart the notes you're hearing and the chords you're hearing and the relationships between them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for jazz, transcription is probably, you know, the, the most important thing that you can do. Uh, learning from the masters that came before you. But yeah, there is a difference between, you know, taking a line and playing it verbatim. So let's say you take a Charlie Parker lick and then you literally just insert that lick into your solo. That's a great way to do it at first. And I highly suggest that everybody do that so you know what it feels like to play uh, what the greats have played before us. But very, very quickly... Um, if you want to kind of make your mark on music, you're going to have to take a left turn from that. And I fully believe, and this is something that we talk a lot about on the podcast, is take a great lick from somebody that you love and then somehow make it your own. So it's more about unpacking the concepts that they're using rather than just learning the line verbatim, right? Um so that, that is a big thing. And I think that that is like, picture your favorite artist, right? So anybody listening out there, think about your favorite artist and why they're your favorite artist. And I think a big reason why they would be is because they're unique. They don't sound like anybody else, right? They have their own voice. Um, so I, I think it's important to develop that as, as quickly as possible. But also jazz is a, is a music where we have to pay homage to the people that came before us and we have to learn from them right it's kind of awesome in jazz and i guess it's like this in a lot of fields but i can take lessons from john coltrane 
simply by sitting and learning the stuff that he played. And, you know, I'm sure I don't have the same thought process as he had, but I can interpret it in my own way. And, you know, in a sort of a once removed kind of way, I am taking lessons from the greats. So I think that's a fantastic way to go about it. Yeah, I really appreciated the way you explained it in your episode on learning learning vocabulary, which was you were immediately saying, yes, learn it, yes, learn it in all 12 keys. But the way to learn it is to think about, you know, what notes are they picking? Are these the chord tones? Are these passing tones? You were really saying, analyze it so that you understand what makes that riff that riff. And then Mm -hmm. obviously you have a much better ability to make it your own or to play it in any key. Um, I I think that's a a subtlety that a lot of people miss out on when they hear the advice, learn vocab or study the greats. They just kind of learn it by rote and and that's that. So I I really appreciated that you went one level beneath and really kind of encouraged people to pick it apart themselves. Yeah, and it can be maddening, to tell you the (laughs) truth, to to try to regurgitate vocabulary exactly. Because, I mean, think about what you're doing at that point. You are trying to play something that you've in essence memorized right so if you get halfway through a line that you memorized and you mess up you're you're done right you're you're gonna you're falling apart at that point because you you never have thought about all right if this line falls apart what do i do what do i do right so for a lot of years i actually did that i would try to insert vocabulary verbatim and i mean my solos were terrible because it really was, it was like trying to cobble together a whole bunch of disparate uh, music. And it didn't sound like me. And if I messed one of the lines up, that was it for the next eight bars. I would just be so mortified that I I couldn't you know, play that Charlie Parker line exactly like I memorized it. And what's wrong with me? Um, and then at some point I realized, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, it's just not going to be sustainable. And it does like going back to the the answer before it doesn't really sound like me, you know? Um, so I think you can almost hear that, uh, when somebody is just kind of regurgitating vocabulary and some people are really, really good at it. Um, and you could still tell that they're kind of doing it, but it sounds amazing. Um, I'm definitely not one of those people. Interesting. It reminds me, um, Scott Devine from Scott's Bass Lessons put out a great video last week called something like The Riff That Everyone Plays Wrong. And Mm -hmm. he had this uh, bass line from Sissy Strutt where he'd put together like five YouTube videos of famous people misplaying this bass line. And (laughs) it's funny because, you know, the point of the video was to teach you how to play it right and to kind of identify, look, this is the rhythm section. This is the bit of the rhythm that everyone plays a different way. But I think the underlying message was interesting because it was all of these famous people play wrong. It doesn't matter. (laughs) You know, they're playing a good bass line. And the fact that it's not 100 percent true to the original really is beside the point. No one no one cares in the audience. Um, So I I think that's an important thing to remember when you're approaching with admiration and respect these greats of jazz. That doesn't prohibit Mm -hmm. you from making it your own and feeling free to interpret it your own way. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, just one last thought on this. If you're trying to sound as good as somebody like Charlie Parker or John Coltrane, that's going to make you feel bad <laughs> because I don't know about you, but I have no delusions of grandeur that I am ever going to be the musician that John Coltrane was. So I think the, the most that I can hope to do is develop my own sound um, and not compare it to somebody like that and not say, well, you know, John Coltrane was playing all of these 16th note lines and he was doing all these different substitutions. And wow, it's it's so amazing. I need to do exactly that. It's it's just not going to happen. So it's better for me to kind of take my own path while continuing to try to be as skilled as I can and as as good as I can at my instrument and the music. Um I find it really kind of toxic for myself to to try to compare myself to somebody like that. Mm-hmm. So we've gone deep there into a few aspects of ear training and improvisation, but I'd love to step back if we could and talk a bit about how you would approach improvising with a student. You know, if someone came to you and let's pretend they're an adult saxophone player who has a few years of technique under their belt. They've got the basics of playing their way through a jazz standard, but they are, you know, on 
step zero when it comes to improvisation. If they come to you and say, hey, Nick, can you teach me to improvise? What would that look like? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think that a lot of it has to do with the individual. Um, I think that would be the most important thing to me is I would kind of like to hear them play first, see what some of their strengths and weaknesses are. But I think a couple of things that I give to all students would be um, knowledge of chord symbols. That's that's one thing that I think turns a lot of people off from the very beginning, because if you if you think about it, this system we have of writing chord changes and uh, what they infer, um, it's it's akin to learning a different language. And, and obviously, we know how intimidating that is uh, to, to learn a completely different language. So I think knowledge of chord symbols and trying to simplify that as much as possible is usually pretty close to the beginning for me um, so that somebody can confidently look at something like the blues or a basic jazz standard um, that has pretty tame chords in it and be able to make sense of that know what the scale that goes along with that chord symbol is, um, know what the chord tones are that go along with that chord symbol. Um, chord tones are really important to me as well because they're kind of the safe zone. Uh, you know that if you're playing a chord tone, it's going to sound good no matter what. Uh, so that's a really, really important thing to give people almost right away because they feel like, all right, at least I can get through this and I know that these four notes will sound good over every single chord. Um, so that's a big thing in my book and that, that goes more to like the analytical side. Um, and then a second thing would be I almost immediately will give somebody an extremely, extremely easy solo to start transcribing. Um, lately, I've been giving all my students like a Chet Baker uh, vocal melody to actually transcribe because he's so clear in the way that he sings and he tends to be very simple, uh, but beautiful and effective. Um, so, you know, knowledge of chord symbols and immediately getting the ear going, uh, immediately getting you to assimilate some stuff in your ears and then reproduce it on your instrument, I think would be the two biggest things. And then, of course, you can branch out into the thousand other skills you need uh, shortly after. But that's a good kind of place to start that doesn't, uh, like you said, intimidate people too much. Very cool. I think those are two really valuable practical starting points. One thing we found is that, like jazz itself, improvisation can be really intimidating to people. And particularly if you come from the classical world, you're taught to not play wrong notes and you're taught to mm -hmm. only play notes if you're confident they're right. Do you have any kind of mindset approaches or kind of philosophy of improv that you impart to your students if they come to you with that kind of rigid concern about making mistakes in improv? Yeah, I think what I would do at first is just kind of play free as, as kind of out there as that sounds. Um, it's a great way to just kind of let go on the instrument. And, and I make it clear to my students, okay, this is not an exercise where we're really trying to accomplish anything. Let's just play, right? And it might sound, it, it, well, it will definitely sound horrible at times. It will definitely sound beautiful at times. But the important part here is that we're just kind of um, connecting with our instrument, connecting with our ears, and just kind of going for it. And you'd be amazed at how nervous this makes people, especially, like you said, people coming from a world where everything is very, very rigid and you, you only play the, you know, the most difficult repertoire and you, you know, at all times when you pick up your instrument, you need to be sounding amazing and um, you can never let anybody see uh, the weaker sides of your playing. That's, it's a very militant way of thinking about music, but it's, it's pervasive in a lot of, um, in a lot of music. So I like to just, I'll never forget this. I had a great, uh, combo instructor in my undergraduate work. And one of the first days that we came into combo, he turned off the lights and he said, all right, we're not turning them on, uh, for the next 40 minutes. And we're just going to play, we're just going to play. 
And it was huge for me. I mean, if the lights had been on, you would have seen the panic written all over my face. But it was really, really beautiful what he did. He turned off the lights to take away any of that self-conscious feeling you might have. Um, You can't see the people you're playing with, so there's no visual communication. Um, And it really, I think it dropped everybody's guard. It opened everybody's ears up. And it provided for this amazing way to connect with this new ensemble that I was playing with. And it kind of set the tone for the rest of the year because we had one of the first days we had had this connection that we all made through our ears and this dropping of ego and uh, dropping of self-consciousness. And we just kind of went for it. So I would say that like if you are somebody who gets caught up in um, feeling tied to a certain way of playing or feeling... uh, married to the aspect of like, I can never let anybody hear me sound anything less but my best. Uh, You know, just get get into a room with your instrument and just play, you know, just play whatever comes into your mind, just, just let it come out of the instrument. Um, And don't judge yourself, you know, Uh, that that has a great way of really opening up your connection with the instrument and your connection with music in general. So I don't know if that's too like woo woo out there. But (laughs) No, I, I love that. I think it's fantastic but because just play is advice you do sometimes hear in the improv mm-hmm. world. You know, the jazz great, so they just picked up the trumpet and they played. But right. what you just explained is 100% practical. It's saying, you know, strip off your inhibitions, strip off your, you know, judgmental voice inside and just get back to connecting with your instrument and your ears and making music for the sake of making music. I right. think that's a, a lovely way to approach improvising. Yeah, because, I mean, when we were kids and we first picked up our instruments, uh, I mean, we sounded horrible, but it was the funnest thing in the world (laughs) to do, right? It was to pick up your instrument, make some interesting sounds. You didn't know what you were doing, but you didn't care. It was kind of the the wonder of that instrument and going, wow, I can actually make a sound on this. This is really cool. Uh, So I try to get back to that. I'm not always uh, super successful at it because I can get caught up in my own stuff just as anybody else can. But um, I I try to do it on a semi-regular basis. Mm, It's interesting. It's something that's come up a few times on the podcast is that concept of beginner's mind and how actually the beginner can have a huge advantage in terms of experimenting and being open to new ways of doing things. But of course, we all get caught in the trap of expertise and those adult inhibitions. It can be really hard to reconnect. So I love that recommended exercise to just kind of maybe even turn off the lights yourself yeah. and and get back to just playing. Yeah. And I, I, I got to some of my youngest students are the most inspiring to me and uh, I'll steal stuff from them all the time, <laughs> whether it be, whether it be just their attitude about the instrument, I'll, I'll start thinking, wow, I need to have more of that kind of attitude, just having fun or whether it be something really, really interesting they do on the instrument that because we're studied musicians that have an expectation about the way we play, we would never do. Um, so I've stolen stuff from elementary school kids a lot <laughs> uh, because they, they just think about it in such a different way than we do. Very cool. So we've talked a lot there and said almost nothing that's specific to the saxophone, but mm-hmm. you are a saxophonist. That is your primary instrument. And I believe you even have a new podcast coming out all about sax. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, myself and a colleague of mine, Donna Schwartz, uh, she lives out in California. She's uh, very, very connected with the saxophone world, saxophone industry. She's a marvelous educator and saxophone player. Uh, so we had an idea to start a podcast. And we're going to call it Everything Saxophone. Um, and what we're really going to try to do is just cover every aspect of playing the instrument. Uh, it's going to be based around interviews with some of our collective favorite saxophone players. Uh, just trying to get into the minds of some of the most talented people in the world. Um, and then, you know, doing stuff like reviewing equipment. Equipment's a big thing for saxophone players. Uh, you can go down that rabbit hole very, very easily. So maybe starting to talk about some of the better equipment out there, uh, reviewing albums. I think it's just going to be generally a place for the saxophone community to kind of rally around. Um, But certainly if you don't play saxophone, I would recommend tuning into the interviews because as we all know, regardless of what instrument you play, 
Uh, there's just brilliant people playing every instrument. Um, and that's one of the things I enjoy the most is hearing interviews with with my heroes and getting into their thought process a little bit. So we're really excited about it. Uh, we're going to launch sometime in March and uh, hopefully bring a brand new episode of interviews and reviews and all that kind of stuff every week. That's amazing. I, I'm a big fan of Donna's, so I'm excited to hear that you guys oh, are great. teaming up on that one. Yeah, she's amazing. So that is, as you say, you know, applicable and interesting, even if you don't play sax. And one thing that jumped out to me on your website was you offer Skype lessons and you say on your website, you know, even if you don't play saxophone, drop me a line and let's talk because maybe I can still help you with jazz, with improv. Tell me how that works. Um, number one, how the Skype lesson thing is working, because I know a lot of our listeners are probably interested but haven't tried it and aren't sure if it is as good as an in-person lesson. And and secondly, you know, specifically if you're teaching someone who doesn't play sax, how does that work? Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to lie and say that Skype lessons are exactly the same as being in the same room with somebody. I mean, it's definitely a different experience, right? So there are some things, you know, subtlety of tone, um, things like things like that, that aren't quite the same when you're teaching over Skype. But I still think that it's a it's an extremely valuable tool. Uh, And I'll use myself as an example. I regularly take lessons with people all over the country um, that Normally, I'd have to get on a plane or get in my car and drive six hours to New York City or something like that. Um, so I'm currently using them myself, and they've been invaluable to me. I, I can take lessons with my heroes from this room that I'm sitting, you know, talking to you in today. Um, so I take a bit of a different approach to Skype lessons, where a lot of it is based on Sibelius. So I'll fire up Sibelius. And that's actually one of the beautiful things about Skype lessons um, is that you can share your screen with with the person you're having a lesson with. And I can literally write out exercises to my heart's content or uh, illustrate any points that I'm making. And I find that students really, really like that. In fact, I have a lot of students that come into the Skype lessons really unsure of whether they're going to like it or not. And then at the end of the lesson, they'll say, wow, you know, that was that was really great. The way that we can share uh, the Sibelius screen and you can kind of anything you're talking to me about, you can immediately illustrate and we can listen to together. Um, so I think that that's one of the greatest, greatest aspects of it. Um, and that makes it something that surprises a lot of people. Um, and then going to your point about, you know, instructing people, not just on the saxophone, Jazz is such a deep topic that, you know, we don't need to be playing the same instrument uh, to get a lot out of our time together because there's a million things that we can talk about as relates to just harmony, um, to ear training. In fact, I have a lot of guitar students. I have flute students. um, I have students of every different instrument. And we're not, obviously, I can't instruct a guitar player on how to, you know, what's the best hand position for this chord or or instrument-specific things. But we can certainly get very, very deep in, okay, how do we play over the blues? Um, How do we start to approach bebop? Um, How do we solidify an ear training routine that works for you? Um, So I find Skype to be really, really great for that kind of stuff. While I would love to be in the same room as all of my students, uh, it's just not possible. And it's really, really great these days that if you find somebody who you really, really enjoy their approach to teaching and their way of thinking about music, you can email them and be virtually in the same room as them the next day if you want to. So I think um, the advantages far outweigh the drawbacks. And I've gotten so much out of taking lessons and teaching over Skype that I think it's one of the best technologies out there. 100% agree. Uh, The advice I give when people ask is that if you're at day one of learning an instrument, Mm -hmm. it might be good to do it in person just because there's the physicality that you might want some pointers on. But after, you know, a month or two of playing, you're absolutely as good doing Skype lessons as in person. And to me, you're much better off with an excellent teacher you get on really well with on Skype than a mediocre teacher who just happens to live down the road. And no disrespect to music teachers, I have huge admiration to all teachers, even the mediocre ones. <laughs> but um, I, I just think, as you say, to be able to connect with someone who truly gets what you're trying to do and teaches in the right way for you is, is a really powerful thing. 
It is. It's invaluable. And, and uh, without a doubt, the comment I hear the most from these, you know, some of the best jazz players in the world that I've been lucky enough to study with over Skype, they always say all of my most serious students are Skype students. Oh, that's interesting. Because it is true. I mean, like if you're willing to, you know, uh, do kind of the distance learning thing, generally you're pretty serious about uh about music and you're you're definitely seeking to take lessons with the best people possible uh even if they don't happen to be in your immediate area so one last thing i wanted to touch on before we wrap up was if someone went to the 10 minute jazz lesson podcast website what they might expect to see is a course on learning jazz but in fact what they'd find Mm -hmm. is a video course called 60 days to crushing the blues and if you're not immersed in the world of jazz yet, that might strike you as pretty odd because to a lot of people, blues is a separate genre to jazz. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that course. Where did that come from and why is it blues that you teach in the course? Yeah, so blues is is probably one of the most important tools for jazz musicians that can open them up to the rest of the world of jazz. Um, and you only need to think about kind of the the linear history of this music, right? I mean, it started uh, in the fields with spirituals. And then shortly after that, it morphed into the blues. And then it morphed into this thing called jazz. Um, And then it morphed into obviously a lot of other things. Um, But jazz really did come from the blues. So every jazz musician is expected to be able to play over the blues. And in fact, that's one of the first things. If you were to look around the United States and you were to uh, take a peek at all of the different states, like Jazz All State, that's what we kind of call it here, um, like the honors bands, generally what you're going to find is the audition requirement is play over a blues, right? So this is, this is one of the most important things. And it's really nice because the blues is very accessible. You know, generally it's a 12 bar form. So you're not caught up in these 32 bar forms that you can get lost in very easily. Generally they're comprised of anywhere from three to seven chords, right? So you're not dealing with a million different chords have come and flying at you as fast as possible. Um, and it really opens, there's a lot of the essential chord progressions that we see in a lot of the other jazz standards or other forms of jazz. They're represented in the blues, right? You know, playing over the one chord, playing over the four chord, playing a two, five, one progression. It's all there in the blues, um, so I, I like to start a lot of my students off. In fact, that's probably about 90 percent of my students. That's the first thing we work on is the blues. And if you can develop a skill set over the blues, you can transfer that skill set to so many other things you're going to do in jazz. So when I developed this video course, um, I thought it would be great to do kind of a reflection of what it would be like if you were studying with me. Um, I would give you a certain assignments to do over this week. And then that would progress into these next assignments and that would progress into these next assignments. And, and one of the tough things is that like if I'm teaching an adult student or an extremely busy uh, high school student, they don't always get to complete that stuff every single week. Um, so with a video course, it's really great because whether you have 20 minutes a day or whether you have eight hours a day, it's kind of a self-guided course of study. So you could spend three weeks on the first week, right? And that's totally fine. Um, But I basically called it 60 Days to Crushing the Blues because it is laid out in, it's an eight week course, right? Um, And it really will bring you from like your very, very basic knowledge. What do these chord symbols mean? uh, How do I get around them? To towards the end of the course, you're really playing some some bebop material and really starting to understand um, how some of the greats approach the, the blues uh, to get that sound that we kind of all want to achieve. So I highly suggest it if you're looking for an easy way to get into improvisation. That could be a great way to start. And um, it's great because you can, like I said, you could really just take yourself through it without anybody kind of breathing down your neck. Um, and I tried to make it as accessible as possible and kind of uh, – make it as high quality as possible. So very cool. And given everything we've been talking about, I'm guessing this is not just something for sax players, right? Exactly. In fact, it comes with, uh, PDFs and, you know, concert pitch, B flat, 
uh, E flat and even bass clef. So it's really accessible to anybody out there. Very cool. Well, it's been such a pleasure to get to talk to you, Nick. I'm a big fan of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast. And anyone listening who's enjoyed hearing us talk about improv and how Nick approaches it, highly recommend checking out that podcast. There's a huge back catalog of really valuable episodes touching on every aspect of jazz and including the kind of improv ideas we've been talking about today. Also, that 60 Days to Crushing the Blues course, I agree, that's a fantastic place to start if you're interested in jazz but feel it might be a bit overwhelming or intimidating. I think the way you've structured that is really elegant. And of course, if you're interested in Skype lessons, um, do check out Nick's website and we'll have links to that and everything mentioned in the show notes. Thank you again, Nick, for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure. Oh man, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you and, and congratulations on your podcast. It's really one of my favorite ones out there. Um, definitely tune in as much as I possibly can and you're doing great stuff over there so keep it going thank you unlock your full musicality with Musical You membership find out more at musicalitypodcast.com forward slash join mm, there was tons packed in there right I've spoken with a lot of jazz musicians and jazz educators and I think Nick stands out as one of the few who manages to be very well versed in the traditions and the norms of learning jazz, while also managing to present it in a very pragmatic and accessible way. It was great to find out more about Nick's own development as a jazz musician, and how he helps his students approach this big topic of learning to improvise. Nick grew up surrounded by music, including jazz, and his dad was a saxophone player. So perhaps it was likely that Nick would go on to be a jazz sax player himself. But interestingly, he says that although having a good ear is a vital part of being a jazz musician and improviser, he wasn't someone who had a naturally good ear for music. He played sax extensively in school and at university across many genres, not just jazz. And he thinks this helped him avoid the jazz snobbery that can be so common. He said it wasn't until his postgraduate studies that he felt he really got to bond closely with his instrument and give it his full attention. Along the way, Nick practiced both active and passive ear training, using all his music listening as an opportunity to learn how music works, as well as doing specific exercises in transcribing and playing by ear to improve his abilities. He recommended sight singing as a great way to train your ear, including using the solfege approach specifically. That is something we 100% agree with here at Musical U, and we've talked more about that in previous episodes. Check out the show notes for this episode for links to those. I loved hearing Nick talk about how he approaches improvising, blending the classic jazz advice to learn from the greats and to memorize vocabulary, with a much deeper intention to truly understand what it is that you're memorizing. By making analysis part of your transcription, you can not only deepen your understanding of how the greats did what they did, but also learn it in a more flexible way, so that you don't need to panic if you forget a bit when you're playing, and you can adapt it to suit your own purposes or your own unique improvisational style. Nick starts his students out with a focus on understanding chord symbols and the corresponding chord tones, which give you a safe set of notes to build your improvisation around and also easy transcription exercises that let them start figuring things out by ear from the beginning. Aside from the practical exercises, I asked Nick about the mindset for improvisation, and he shared that great story of when his combo instructor turned out the lights and focused this group of musicians who'd never played together before on trusting their ears and communicating directly through music. It's that spirit of just playing but I loved how Nick unpacked that a little, because often when beginner improvisers are told to just play, it's really frustrating because they have such high expectations of the magical, talented improvisation that's meant to just come out instinctively, and that's not what actually happens. Nick explained that it's actually about shedding your expectations and your self-judgment, and getting back to that childlike enthusiasm for just making sound and also the beginner's mind that's open to all kinds of new possibilities, and can thereby discover some things that even an adult professional jazz musician thinks are worth stealing. A lot of Nick's expertise goes beyond saxophone. For example, in the Skype lessons he offers for jazz and improv on any instrument, and his course 60 Days to Crushing the Blues, 
which is a great starting point for exploring jazz, whatever instrument you play. Saxophone is his primary instrument, though, and so I was excited to hear that he's teaming up with another of the leading sax educators online, Donna Schwartz, to launch their new Everything Saxophone podcast. Whatever stage you're at in your own improv journey, I hope you found some really useful ideas in this episode. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for our next episode where we'll be talking about an often overlooked aspect of improvisation, and that's improvising rhythm. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.